we're gonna cover multiple ways that you can improve your VO2 max, and we're gonna start right now. So when we're looking at VO2 max, what is that in its simplest form, okay? And if we look at volume of oxygen at its maximum, so how much volume of oxygen can your muscles take on or how much can your body use when we're in a situation that is intense so where we need to consume a large amount of oxygen to make sure that our muscles can continuously fire okay so this has a very big role if we have a better vo2 max typically we will be better at endurance based sports and even we'll be better at combat sports okay so think about mma or boxing or wrestling uh, judo anything along those lines where you need to be strong but you also if you have a higher vo2 max in turn you're going to be able to perform quite a bit better same thing like a distance runner right 800 meters 1500 meters marathoner if they have a higher vo2 max they can utilize oxygen at a higher level Level, and in turn, they are more fatigue resistant comparative to someone who has a lower VO2 max. So we wanna cover one of the coolest papers here, the relationship between hemoglobin and VO2 max, a systematic review and analysis. And what we're gonna see here in this specific paper is that PLOS1, okay, PLOS1. And they've done some interesting research on, which we'll talk about later in this uh, actual breakdown. They've done some research also on EPO. So when we're trying to look at increasing VO2 max, we can see that hemoglobin, which is a protein used by red blood cells to transport oxygen, that there's a really, really direct link between hemoglobin and VO2 max. And this is gonna help us as coaches and as athletes to figure out if we can turn the knob on hemoglobin, Globin, in turn, we should be able to increase our VO2 max, which is what we're about to see. So some of the quick breakdowns here is that researchers in this review saw that in 226 observational studies, so right here, 226 observational studies and 158 interventional studies, uh, that they broke this down into a specific type of analysis. And in turn, they saw that in those 226, I'm gonna highlight this, in this 226 observational studies, that when VO2 max was higher, there was a direct link to a larger amount of hemoglobin being present inside of the blood. And then when they started to look at the interventional data of that 158 studies, that when the VO2 max would start to increase, there was also an increase in hemoglobin. So it was like, okay, VO2 max starts to come up, hemoglobin goes up, VO2 max starts to go up, this goes up. So these things would be doing things interventionally. In the observational study, it was just, this is here, this is a high VO2 max. Oh, this is high, larger amounts of hemoglobin. So that's what they ended up seeing in that specific paper, okay? Or in that meta-analysis. So when we're looking at it, if we can just quickly break down, uh, hemoglobin is a protein in the red blood cells, and that is in turn used, it's essentially how much oxygen the muscles will have to work with. The level of hemoglobin that's present in your red blood cells, that's transporting the oxygen, and then when we see, okay, a higher amount of hemoglobin will in turn mean that the hemoglobin is now presenting a higher amount of oxygen for usage. Okay, so that's just a real important relationship that we've got to understand. And some of the interesting things in this meta-analysis is that even where there's a direct physiological manipulation of hemoglobin levels, so let's say, so there's a blood transfusion or a blood donation of some sense, what ends up happening is that when the knob changes, VO2 max also changes. It either goes up when there's a transfusion or when their blood is being removed, it decreases. And we're gonna go into a little bit deeper detail on some of this, because this meta-analysis is absolutely fantastic. It's really, really interesting. And then we're gonna try and break down, okay, what can you guys do? What can you take away from this to become more endurance prone so that you can handle that fatigue, so that you can actually prevent that fatigue. Okay, so looking at this from the top-down perspective, okay, and in this meta-analysis, they even mentioned that there's some other papers that have broken down six weeks of sprint-based training, has led to an increase in blood volume, an increase in VO2 max, and an increase in cardiac output. And that's gonna take us to what other things could we be measuring or could we see possibly being altered when we increase our VO2 max? And that's gonna be that cardiac output. Okay, that's going to be potentially muscle fiber alterations to becoming, you know, more fatigue resistance. That's going to be also potentially a shift in the number and quality of mitochondria. Okay, so if we have more sprint work done here and we have more long, slow distance work here, the quality of the mitochondria, the means of respiration will also increase. And that in turn will, will lead to an improvement in our VO2 max. 
and a deeper volume of hemoglobin that's present in our red blood cells. As we do this, even as they break this down, they've even mentioned, okay, there was a six week study on sprint-based training. During those six weeks, we saw an improvement in cardiac output and VO2 max. When that occurred, and what they ended up doing is when they actually withdrew blood from these individuals, they saw almost an immediate reversal of their VO2 max. So now it's basically these two factors go hand in hand. And so we've got to figure out now, what can athletes do? If we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, all right, we know VO2 max goes together with hemoglobin. What does that mean as far as long-term development? And that's where we can start to get into some of this potential PED usage. And that's some of the big factors here is that there's mechanistic aspects behind all of this stuff. Okay, so if we can look at something like PED usage, that's gonna help us identify further what you can do without PEDs. That's where someone like Shelby Houlihan tests positive for Nandrolone. Well, why was this individual using Nandrolone? And she played the, the role of, well, why would I use Nandrolone? It's, a, it's an old school bodybuilding drug. It wouldn't be effective for endurance-based training. It was in my meat. It was in the food that I was eating. She tried to prove it was in her food and couldn't do it. But when that happens, you have to go, okay, why would we be using Nandrolone? A Nandrolone street drug name is DECA. And in the old school times of, of bodybuilding, it'd be like DECA and D-Ball, use DECA and D-Ball. But DECA, Nandrolone, also has been shown to increase red blood cell mass. If it increases red blood cell mass, it will increase hemoglobin. If it increases hemoglobin, it will have a direct impact on VO2 max. It also has a positive impact on joints. Distance running is very hard on the joints. And if we see that increase in red blood cell mass, we in turn see hemoglobin rise and then in turn VO2 max. Therefore, that's why that nandrolone was used by Shelby Houlihan for her PED usage. So, we should not be using that if you're in a drug tested sport. The next big factor, and if we look at this, this paper here, okay, this paper was published by PLOS One. So they also published another paper specifically around EPO. And inside of the paper around EPO, we saw that, okay, four weeks of EPO injections increased hemoglobin by 19.7%. Four weeks hemoglobin went up almost 20%, which corresponded to a 6% improvement in 3000 meter times with zero change in training. Exact same volume, exact same intensity, up 6% just from four weeks. That's just four weeks. So that would be like, let's compare this for the strength world if we're bench pressing. We do the exact same amount of rep and in four weeks, we take our a 400 pound, let's say we have a 400 pound max and in four weeks we had 25 pounds by doing the exact same work just in four weeks. And that happens you know, over and over and over again. So that's another big factor is EPO has shown that that can lead to an improvement or an increase in hemoglobin, which in turn increases to a positive impact on our VO2 max. Then we look at transfusions. Okay, so blood doping. That's where, you know, the old school cyclists would get blood transfusions. They would get these blood transfusions and ideally that would increase their overall VO2 max potentially. Now, there has been some research on both sides of that. How much impact can actually be happening if we're getting blood uh, doping involved? Now, blood removal does play a more substantial role as we've seen in the sprint-based paper, but blood addition is still, I would say probably favorable, but not as powerful as EPO or as Nandrolone. So what can we do if we're in these sports and we need to improve our VO2 max, we need to improve our hemoglobin levels, but we're also getting drug tested. We don't wanna use drugs. So the first thing we have to do is dial in our nutrition, make sure that our iron is dialed in first. So if we're looking at low ferritin, low ferritin is a protein that stores iron. Okay, that's a big factor here. So if ferritin is storing iron, Okay, that's a protein that stores iron. The next big factor is that leads to low hemoglobin if your ferritin levels are low. And that in turn will lead to a low hematocrit. And if our hematocrit is low, that can in turn have a negative impact on hemoglobin, which also will have a negative impact on oxygen transport. So make sure that our iron is as dialed in as possible. You've gotta get blood tests done. You've also gotta make sure that you're eating well and potentially you might need a high quality iron supplement. And that can have a direct role on your VO2 max. The next factor would be training at altitude for extended periods of time. Okay, so if we want to see an improvement, an immediate improvement, 
we can train at altitude for long periods of time, like three, four, five weeks. That's where we're gonna to start to see a better impact uh, from altitude training. Now, one of the big factors is that people will go train at altitude for a week and then they leave and then they go compete three weeks later and that transfer is not gonna be there. You've got to train at altitude and then your body will only hold that advantage for about one to two weeks, potentially. Now, if you're at altitude all the time, I think there is a longer overlay. One thing I wanted to bring up is that actually this time last year, I spent a week in Bogota, Colombia. That's where their sprint cycling team trains in Colombia is in Bogota. Bogota is at altitude. As soon as you get off the plane, you start gasping for air and you notice within the first two or three days, if you go out for a run or you do anything that's more endurance based, you get really lightheaded very quickly. And what's interesting is that when I was monitoring my O2, it took me almost exactly three days and then it immediately started to kick in that I could handle the altitude base work. So we've got to look at that and then recognize how long. So if we have a competition and we're training at altitude, how long can our body hold on to that advantage? That's a big aspect there. Then the next thing we'd be doing heat based training. So another study here, the effect of sauna based heat acclimation on plasma volume and heart variability. Okay. This paper shows Okay, that inside of training, well-trained male cyclists were monitored for 35 consecutive days. They had eight days training, 10 days training plus sauna, 17 uh, baseline training. Sauna exposure consisted of 30 minutes, 87 degrees Celsius, immediately following normal training. 87 degrees Celsius, it's pretty hot. Capillary blood volume samples were collected while resting seated to assess PV changes. So that's plasma volume. So when we see this, a submaximal cycle test, five minutes at 125 uh, watts, was performed on days one, eight, 15, 22, 25, 29, 35. And then they analyzed the heart rate recovery. Okay, effects were examined using different magnitude base inferences. Now, the interesting part here is that the conclusions, sauna bathing following normal training largely expanded, plas expanded plasma volume in well-trained cyclists after just four exposures. Okay, so if we're trying to increase plasma volume, if we're trying to increase that cardiac output or blood volume, we can start to use heat-based exposure four sessions and this is an elite level cyclist just four sessions okay so if we're doing this four sessions a week five sessions a week permanently and even if we have novice or intermediate level endurance athletes we're going to see a positive impact on that blood volume which in turn will raise hemoglobin which in turn will lead to higher vo2 max okay so that heat exposure is one really really cool method also, I believe sleep's gonna have a huge impact on your recovery, which will in turn improve this. So if we wanna improve hemoglobin, if we look at what has happened uh, in the world of performance enhancing drugs, nandrolone, EPO, I think even some of these guys have used oxandrolone and, and blood transfusions. Those are the things that have been showing what the mechanism is. So then if we look at that mechanism, say, okay, altitude training, improving iron, improving their sleep, and ultimately that heat exposure in saunas at 87 seven degrees Celsius or higher, that's gonna to lead to overall better performance. And I wanna provide to Fahrenheit, that's 188 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we're training in heat exposure anywhere from 87 degrees Celsius, which is 188 degrees Fahrenheit, I've seen studies that have had a positive impact all the way as low as 170 degrees Fahrenheit. So use these four key factors around training, improve your sleep, make sure that sometime if you're an endurance-based athlete, you can get out and train at altitude, see how that impacts you. Get those iron levels dialed in, try to make sure that you get some type of blood work from your doctor and you can see it, where is your ferritin at. And then finally that heat exposure, you know, four days of heat exposure. And that's all things that you can do outside of the sprint interval work and that long, slow distance work. That's gonna help improve hemoglobin and also in turn lead to a better VO2 max. If you guys need help with your strength training, if you guys need help with your programming in general, head over to peakstrength.app, the Google Play Store and the Apple iOS Store. Download Peak Strength today. You're gonna get five free workouts so that you can become a freak. Because remember, freaks, if you wanna become a champion, you've always gotta cultivate your power. Peace.